Hey, it's Father Dave, and I wanted to share my thoughts for a while about the whole coronavirus lockdown reality uh, as we experience it here in, in uh, Sydney. And I'm conscious, I've, I've held off on saying anything because I'm just not looking forward to people attacking me and telling me I'm an idiot or irresponsible or leading people astray or anything. I just having said that, I'm, I'm reaching a point where I'm thinking something needs to be said. I need to clear my heart on this. And if people disagree with me, I expect them to disagree with me. But uh, hear me out. And uh, I'm just conscious we've lost a lot of what we took as for granted as individual freedoms lately. I mean, firstly, they told me you're not allowed to, to practice your religion as you're used to practicing it in corporate worship. Okay. And then um, you're not allowed to go to work. Well, that was for a lot of people. A lot of people. Uh, and then, okay, you've got to stay home. You've got to stay away from people. You can't touch people. You can't. Okay. Um, I'm told there are good reasons for putting these things in place, of course. Um, you know, it's for the good of the community as a whole. Well, we're always told it's for the good of the community as a whole, you know, so I, I don't want to just take that at surface uh, value. Um, there has never been a point where people's rights have been basic rights to sort of freedom of movement and things like that have been taken away without them being told it's for the common good. I mean, look, when the Nazis came through and took out you know, all the Jewish people and communist people and gypsies in your neighbourhood, it was for the common good. Now, I'm not suggesting there's a parallel situations by any means, but uh, whenever you find your freedoms taken away, it's always um, sold as being for the common good. I mean, when we sent our boys off to Van Am, that was for the common good. When we invaded Iraq, that was for the common good. And it, the question for me is how far do we... Except this, do we draw a line at some point? You know, I mean, we used to believe in this country that the government had a right to sacrifice our children in a war. Conscription. We, I, th I think we don't buy into that in this country anymore. We wouldn't buy into that. Uh, where do we draw the line with this? Where can our government say, OK, you can't leave home? OK, you can't touch people? OK. If they say, oh, sorry, you're not allowed to hug your children anymore, is that OK? Um, you can't hold hands with your partner or something, you know. Well, is there a point where we say, no, hang on, that's not okay? Now, again, okay, it's all for the sake of the, of the public health, supposedly, but as I say, it's always for the sake of the public health. And the question is, is it really um, for the sake of, of, of public health and at, at what cost? I mean, I don't want to sound brutal about it, but we are always trading off public health against other benefits, of course we are, uh, for better or for worse. Um, you know, we could reduce road accidents to zero tomorrow by banning cars from the roads today, cars and trucks and all vehicles. Ban all vehicles, you stop all road deaths. Now, we're not, yeah, we, we hate the road deaths, we try and minimise them, but we're not ready to take that sort of step, are we? Um, Likewise, we could solve an enormous number of problems by banning the sale of alcohol. Um, you know, they did that back in Prohibition in the US. And if you go to Iran, I've been to Iran four times, I think, in the last eight years. And yeah, amazing place about Iran. You can go out into parks in the middle of the night there and you find kids playing badminton and things. And it's part of being in a society where nobody drinks. There's no rowdy behaviour in the evenings. Um, Hey, having said that, I don't want to live in Iran. I like to be able to have have a have a beer myself. And um, but I recognise, you know, if we banned the sale of alcohol, we'd have less, um, you know, violent behaviour on the streets, less domestic abuse. I suspect there'd be all sorts of um, uh, health benefits that would come from that. But we don't. We're not ready to make that trade. On the contrary, in this current crisis, sale of alcohol has been seen as an essential service. <laughs> so there's a, we're always trading off. And and the fact is here is not purely uh, 
community health that we're looking at either. I'm, I'm sure, you know, I look at the way in which, um, you know, our, our bishops reacted early on, or at least archbishops in different uh, areas of the church, very quickly went beyond what the government was asking in terms of stop going to church, don't uh, meet, don't do this, don't... And, OK, it, yes, it's concern for public health, but look, let's be honest, it's also um, next door to the... Uh, you know, the Archbishop's office is the, is the risk management office and, and the legal office, and they're not wanting to be sued because, you know, you, my grandmother died because you didn't tell her not to go to church. So, yeah, look, there are economic issues here as well. And, and you know, my guess is that, um, and, and from a, the politician's point of view, there's just the uh, whipped up fear of the population driving them uh, to want to be seen to be taking whatever measures are necessary. Uh, the question is, what measures are necessary? And it's interesting, you look around the world, you see different models in different countries. I know this, the Netherlands at the moment is taking a different approach, looking at this herd immunity concept. What I'm saying is it's not crystal clear that the way we're going is the only way to go. Okay? So... The question for me is, OK, yes, we do have health concerns. Uh, they're, we, they're valid health concerns. We weigh them against other concerns, as we always do. And there are issues of uh, individual human rights, but there are also massive, massive issues of um, uh, life and health in terms of people losing their jobs. Um, the number of people I know personally who send it are out now out of work been laid off uh, working for airlines, working for hotels, working in services that are being uh, damaged deeply. Uh, but my, I don't know whether the economy will recover. And it's not just a question of the economy as a, as a creature in itself. I'm talking about people losing their homes, uh, people being on the street. Now, I know the government's trying to take measures by printing more money and other things to alleviate the problems, but... There's only so long you can do that. I don't know whether this is going to result in a lot of people being homeless. They can't make their mortgage payments because they're not working. They say most of us are only a few weeks away from uh, bankruptcy. Yeah, me too. Um, I don't know what the results will be for so many people at the bottom of society. And there's the people at the bottom economically and there's also the big issue for me, people with mental health issues. Uh, many of whom I know are being deeply affected and I've heard <laughs> you know, we need people, people who need human touch. Uh, it's interesting in, in the Hebrew Bible, I, th I believe the Hebrew concept of bazaar, skin, it's, it's something that makes us human because we can touch each other. There's a profound concept there that it's fundamental to our humanity that we're able to touch each other. If we're not able to touch each other, this does seem to me like a genuine uh, compromising of our humanity. Okay, maybe we need to compromise that aspect of our humanity, but there are people are struggling with mental health issues who find that compromise more difficult than most of us. So the question for me is, is it worth the trade-off what we're doing now? And the answer is, I don't know. I see different models, I hear different statistics, I hear people saying, well, only 20% of us are actually vulnerable to this disease. Um, why aren't we focusing our energies on protecting those 20% uh, as caringly as possible, perhaps isolating those persons and looking after them and making sure they're protected and letting the 80% of us get on with running the country? I don't know. But I am concerned about the loss of individual freedoms, as I am concerned about the overall health risk, of course. But I get the feeling some of the people making these rules are not the people who have the most to lose. You know, when Bill Gates says you can't go on and just buy your house and ignore the pile of bodies in the corner, that's sort of easy for him to say. I'm sorry, Bill. But, you know, there are a lot of people who stand to lose out uh, at the bottom here that I'm deeply concerned about. Yes, I'm concerned about the health. Are there other ways of dealing with it? I don't know. And I don't know if we'll be allowed to know because fear at the moment, I believe, is what is controlling the course we're taking. 
And uh, that, that's a very dangerous thing. Fear gets us into wars. Fear um, causes all sorts of problems. But the scripture says perfect love, perfect love casts out all fear. Hopefully there's a way of love, a way forward uh, for all of us. God bless you.